Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for coming here uh, this afternoon. I'm going to have the, uh, the privilege, the, the, the pleasure to share with you uh, one of my favorite books of poetry ever uh, that I was lucky enough to encounter in grad school, uh, to read, uh, to fall in love with, and to meet the author and having her agreeing uh, to have me translated to Spanish for publication um, originally in Spain, where I am from. Um, I apologize from the very beginning for my um, accent. Um, I, uh, I'm a poet myself, but in Spanish, uh, so I'll try to uh, uh, do my best uh, to transmit at least a little bit of that to the English uh, reading, especially taking into account that Rita, uh, Rita Duff is one of the best readers I've ever heard in any language. Um, I would like to start by uh, reading just what, um, what she wrote about the book um, uh, in the first edition in um, Norden, and then I'll read my little introduction in Spanish. And from then on, I will just share with you six texts, six poems of the book that Rita herself chose for our first reading together. And I think it was a wonderful selection uh, that she made, so I don't wanna, I don't wanna, uh, uh, try to make it better because I would have probably done it worse. Um, so, uh, Sonata Mulatica uh, by Rita Dove. Um, Rita Dove uh, needs no introduction, uh, but I always like to say she was um, poet laureate uh, of the United States. Um, she was poet laureate of Virginia, a Pulitzer awardee, uh, and one of the great uh, poets of this continent. Um, about Sonata Mulatica, uh, it says, um, the introduction says, a footnote in musical history becomes the keystone to Rita Dove's latest book-length lyric narrative. This is important because it's a poetry collection, but it is a, a total narrative. It's a story. In 1803, violinist George Paul Green Bridgetower, uh, born 1780, dead um, 1860, wunderkind progeny of a white European woman, actually Polish, um, and a black African prince travels from London to Vienna to meet the continent's bad boy musical genius, Ludwig van Beethoven. By all rights, the sonata subsequently inspired by and composed in honor of the mulatto's talents should have borne his name had not young George, still exuberant from having premiered the difficult piece to great acclaim, become fresh with a girl Ludwig also fancy. Around this crucial moment, Dove, Rita, builds a passionate, eccentric pageant of 18th and 19th century life from Haydn's discovery of the dark-skinned child genius in the servants' quarters of a Hungarian castle to Paris right before the French Revolution. From the Prince of Wales' doomed pleasure palace in Brighton to the raucous open-air entertainments offered by Vienna's Prater. From Napoleon's ravaged battlegrounds to the self-satisfied refinements of Cambridge. A panoply of luminaries and extras, grave robbers and courtiers, street musicians and aristocrats populates this grandiose yet melancholy poetic tale by one of our most celebrated poets. Sonata Mulatica es un poemario de envergadura creativa poco frecuente, imposible de encasillar. Si bien su expresión fundamental es la lírica, este libro es un mundo de mundos. Es una novela de formación, es una biografía de artista, es un drama basado en hechos reales, un homenaje a la música, una reivindicación del africano en la cultura universal, un ajuste de cuentas contra una historia siempre escrita por el poderoso, un museo de pinturas prerrománticas, una farsa de corte europea, un relato de viajes, una celebración y crítica de la amistad, un análisis de las consecuencias del deseo y la ambición humanas, una tragedia de una injusticia épica de la pérdida, oda e imprecación al genio. Pero es, sobre todo, un ejemplo de escritura poética total, donde una Rita Duff en estado de gracia ha conseguido armonizar una multitud de registros tonales y genéricos para contar, pintar, musicar, danzar y escenificar ante el lector la historia verídica del violinista mulato George Augustus Paul Green Bridge Tower, para quien Beethoven escribió la famosa sonata que por un azar efímero y a consecuencia de un despecho tabernario entre amigos, 
acabaría portando el nombre de Kreutzer y no el original Perun Mulattico Lunático en italiano. Duff ha compuesto para nuestro placer una fábula inolvidable, una variación maestra sobre uno de los temas que han cautivado al ser humano desde el origen de la poesía y el arte, el cuento de lo que pudo ser y nunca fue ni será. So, the book, the story of this book uh, is the story of George Paul Green Bridge Tower, uh, this violinist uh, whose mother was uh, a Polish aristocrat, uh, white, and um, her father, his father was um, an African aristocrat uh, that met in Europe back in the 18th century. And uh, this story is actually based on real events. Um, I'm going to start with the first poem called The Bridge Tower. The Bridge Tower. There's a quote by Ludwig van Beethoven, the original dedicatory of his sonata. Per il mulatto bridge d'aua, gran pazzo e compositore mulattico. In Italian, Ludwig van Beethoven, 1803. It was at the beginning, if he had been older, if he hadn't been dark, brown eyes ablaze in that remarkable face, if he had not been so gifted, so young a genius with no time to grow up. If he hadn't grown up, undistinguished to an obscure old age. If the piece had actually been, as Kreutzer exclaimed, unplayable, even after our men had played it and for years no one else was able to follow, so that the composer's fury would have raged for naught and wagging tongues could keep alive the original dedication from the title page he shredded. Oh, if only Ludwig had been better looking, or cleaner, or a real aristocrat, von instead of the unexceptional van from some Dutch farmer, if his ears had not already begun to squeal and whistle, if he hadn't drunk his wine from lead cups, if he could have found true love, then the story would have held. In 1803, George Paul Green Brits Tower, son of Friedrich Augustus, the African prince, and Maria Anna Sovinki of Biala in Poland, traveled from London to Vienna, where he met the great master who would stop work on his third symphony to write a sonata for his new friend, to premiere triumphantly, triumphantly on May 24th, whereupon the composer himself leapt up from the piano to embrace his lunatic mulatto. Who knows what would have followed? They might have palled around some, just a couple of wild and crazy guys strutting the town like rock stars, hitting the bars for a few beers, a few laughs, instead of falling out over a girl nobody remembers, nobody knows. Then this bright-skinned papa's boy could have sailed his 15-minute fame straight into the record books where instead of a Regina Carter or Aaron Dworkin or Boy Tinsley sprinkling here and there, we would find rafts of black kids scratching out scales on their matchbox violins so that someday they might play the impossible. Beethoven's Sonata No. 9 in A major, Opus 47, also known as the Bridge Tower. Los Bridge Tower. Per il mulatto Bridge Tower, gran pazzo e compositore mulattico. Ludwig van Beethoven, 1803. Fue al principio. Si él hubiera sido mayor, si no hubiera sido oscuro, ojos marrones en llamas en ese rostro extraordinario, si no hubiera sido tan talentoso, tan joven genio sin tiempo para crecer, si no hubiera crecido común y corriente hasta una oculta y vieja edad. Si de verdad la pieza hubiera sido, como exclamó Kreutzer, intocable, incluso después de que nuestro hombre la tocara y durante años nadie más pudiera seguirle, de forma que la furia del compositor hubiera rabiado por nada y un agitar de lenguas pudiera mantener viva la dedicatoria original de la primera página que él trituró. Oh, si tan solo Ludwig hubiera sido más apuesto, 
o más limpio, o un aristócrata de veras, von en lugar del vulgar van de algún granjero holandés. Si sus oídos no hubieran empezado ya a chirriar y pitar, si no hubiera bebido su vino en tazas de plomo, si hubiera podido encontrar el amor verdadero. Entonces, la historia habría resistido. En 1803, George Paul Green Bridgetower, hijo de Friedrich Augustus, el príncipe africano, y María Ana Sovinki de Biala, Polonia, viajó de Londres a Viena, donde conoció al gran maestro, que detendría la labor de su tercera sinfonía para escribir una sonata y que su nuevo amigo la estrenara triunfantemente el 24 de mayo, tras lo cual el compositor mismo saltó del piano para abrazar a su mulato lunático. ¿Quién sabe qué habría venido después? Puede que hubieran sido amigos por un tiempo, tan solo un par de tipos locos y salvajes pavoneándose por la ciudad como estrellas de rock, de bar en bar a por unas pocas cervezas, unas pocas risas, risas, en vez de pelearse por una chica que nadie recuerda, que nadie conoce. Entonces, este niño de papá y de piel radiante habría navegado en sus 15 minutos de fama directo a las crónicas, donde en vez de una Regina Carter o un Aaron Dworkin o un Boyd Tinsley esparcidos aquí y allá, encontraríamos montones de niños negros arrancando escalas a sus violines de juguete para que algún día pudieran tocar lo imposible. La sonata número 9 en la mayor, opus 47, también conocida como la Bridge Tower. What doesn't happen? The notion that the carriage wheels clattering through Paris remind him of the drums from the islands in his father's tales. Click, clack, sputterwear. He could make a song of it, dance these four in hand down the cobbles of the Rue du Bac as he balances his small weight against the pricking cushions. Clack, sputterwear. All the cadences jumbled together, except the thudding dirge of his heart. That he can see, in curtain twilight, the violin case in his lap twitch with every jounce, like an animal trapped under the hunter's eye. That he can sense, down shrouded alleys, danger rustling just as surely as he can feel spring's careless fingers feathering his chest and smell April's ferment in the stink of the poor marching toward him. Though none of this is true, he hears nothing but clatter. He can't see the rain-slicked arc of the bridge passing under him as the pale stone of the palace rears up and he climbs down to be whisked into the massive salle de machine, his father's cloak folded back like a bat's tucked wing because it was a dry spring that year on the continent. Nonetheless, he ignores his heart's thudding and steps out onto the flickering stage, deep and treacherous, as a lake still frozen at sunset, aglow with reflected light. Soon, the music will take him across. He'll feel each string's ecstasy thrum in his head and only then dare to open his eyes to gaze past the footlights at the rows of powdered curls. Let's see the toy bird jump his hoops, nodding lorgnettes poised, not hearing but judging, except for that tall man on the aisle, with hair the orange of fading leaves, and the two girls beside him, one a younger composition of snow and embers, but the other, oh, the other dark, dark yet warm as the violin's nut-brown sheen, miraculous creature who fastens her solemn black gaze on the boy as if to say, you are what I am, what I yearn to be, so that he plays only for her and not for her keepers. And when he's finally free to stare back, applause rippling over the ramparts, even then she does not smile. Just a brief note um, to say that the she in this poem is Sally Hemings, uh, that Rita says it's a poetic license, but um, it is historical that Thomas Jefferson was attending this concert uh, in Paris uh, because at the time he was the American ambassador 
um, uh, representative uh, to the Paris uh, Parisian court, and uh, she imagines that um, Thomas Jefferson um, was with Sally Hemings there. <coughs> Lo que no pasa. La noción de que las ruedas del carruaje repiqueteando por París le recuerdan los tambores isleños de los cuentos de su padre. Clic, clac, run, run, renqué. Él podría hacer una canción con ello. Bailar con este carruaje por los adoquines de la Rue du Bac mientras mantiene el equilibrio de su pequeño peso contra los cojines que pinchan. Clic, clac, run, run, renqué. Todas las cadencias revueltas, excepto el ruido sordo del canto fúnebre de su corazón. Que pueda ver, a la luz acortinada del ocaso, cómo en su regazo la funda del violín se sacude con cada tumbo, como un animal atrapado bajo el ojo del cazador. Que pueda sentir, por callejuelas neblinosas, el peligro que cruje tan seguramente como él puede sentir los dedos descuidados de la primavera abanicando su pecho y oler el fermento de abril en el hedor de los pobres que marchan hacia él. Aunque nada, nada, nada de esto es verdad. No oye nada sino el repiqueteo. No puede ver el arco lamido por la lluvia del puente que pasa bajo él, mientras la piedra pálida del palacio se yergue y él desciende para ser llevado con rapidez a la masiva sal de machine, la capa de su padre doblada como el ala plegada de un murciélago. Porque era una primavera seca, ese año en el continente. No obstante, él ignora el ruido sordo de su corazón y sale al escenario titilante, hondo y traicionero, como un lago aún congelado al amanecer, rebosante de luz reflejada. Pronto la música le transportará. Sentirá el éxtasis de cada cuerda rasguear en su cabeza y solo entonces se atreverá a abrir los ojos para ver, más allá de las candilejas, las filas de rizos empolvados, veamos al oso saltando sus aros, a sentir, los impertinentes listos, sin escuchar, sino juzgando. A excepción de ese hombre alto del pasillo, con el pelo naranja de las hojas que se apagan, y las dos chicas a su lado, una es una composición más joven de nieve y brasas, pero la otra... Oh. La otra es oscura, oscura pero cálida como el brillo avellana del violín, criatura milagrosa que fija su solemne mirada negra en el chico, como para decir, tú eres lo que yo soy, lo que anhelo ser. Así que él toca solo para ella y no para sus guardianes, y cuando finalmente él es libre para devolver la mirada, con el aplauso propagándose por las murallas, incluso entonces... Ella no sonríe. Ludwig van Beethoven's return to Vienna. <coughs> oh, you men who think or say that I am malevolent, stubborn, or misanthropic, how greatly do you wrong me? A quote by Beethoven from his The Heilige Stadt Testament. Three miles from my adopted city lies a village where I came to peace. The world there was a calm place, even the great Danube no more than a pale ribbon tossed onto the landscape by a girl's careless hand. Into this stillness I had been ordered to recover. The hills were gold with late summer. My rooms were too, plus a small kitchen situated upstairs in the back of a cottage at the end of the Herengasse. From my window I could see onto the courtyard where a linden tree twined skyward, twined skyward. Leafy umbilicus canted toward light, warped in the very act of yearning. And I would feed on the sun as if that alone would dismantle the silence around me. At first I raged. Then music raged in me, Rising so swiftly, I could not write quickly enough to, the ease, to ease the roiling. I would stop to light a lamp, and whatever I'd missed, larks flying to nest, church bells, the shepherds home to toward evening song, rushed in, and I would rage again. I am by nature a conflagration. 
I would rather leap than sit and be looked at. So when my proud city spread her gypsy skirts, I re-entered, burning towards her greater constant light. Call me rough, ill-tempered, slovenly. I tell you, every tenderness I have ever known has been nothing but thwarted violence, an ache so permanent and deep, the lightest touch awakens it. It is impossible to care enough. I have returned with the second symphony and 15 piano variations, which I've named Prometheus, after the rogue titan. They have a god who knew the worst sin is to take what cannot be given back. I smile and bow, and the world is loud. And though I dare not lean in to shout, can you see that I'm deaf? I also cannot stop listening. El regreso a Viena de Ludwig van Beethoven. Oh vosotros, hombres que pensáis o decís que soy malévolo, cabezota o misántropo, cuán grandemente me dañáis. El testamento Heiligenstadt. A tres millas de mi ciudad adoptiva hay un pueblo al que vine buscando paz. El mundo era allí un lugar tranquilo. Ni siquiera el gran Danubio era más que un pálido lazo tirado al paisaje por la mano descuidada de una niña. En esta quietud se me había ordenado recuperarme. Las colinas eran de oro con el verano tardío. Mis habitaciones eran dos y una pequeña cocina, en el piso de arriba de la parte posterior de una casita al final de la Hegengasse. Desde mi ventana podía ver el patio donde un tilo se trenzaba al cielo, umbilicus frondoso inclinado hacia la luz, torcido en el mismo acto del anhelo. Y yo me alimentaba del sol como si eso solo desmantelase el silencio en torno a mí. Al principio me enfurecí. Entonces la música se enfureció en mí, creciendo tan deprisa que yo no podía escribirlo bastante rápido para calmar la agitación. Me paraba para encender una lámpara y lo que me hubiera perdido, alondras volando a su nido, campanas de iglesia, la canción del pastor que a la tarde vuelve a casa entraba como una tromba y yo me enfurecía otra vez. Soy por naturaleza una conflagración. Antes saltaría que sentarme y que me miraran. Así que cuando mi orgullosa ciudad extendía sus faldas de gitana, entré de nuevo en ella, ardiendo hacia su luz mayor y constante. Llamadme duro. Gruñón, desaliñado, os cuento que toda la ternura que jamás conocí no ha sido nada sino una frustrada violencia, un dolor tan permanente y hondo que el roce más leve lo despierta. Es imposible preocuparse bastante. He regresado con una segunda sinfonía y quince variaciones para piano que he llamado Prometeo, como el titán granuja, el medio dios que sabía que el peor pecado es tomar lo que no puede devolverse. Sonrío y hago una reverencia, y el mundo es ruidoso. Y aunque no me atrevo a inclinarme para gritar, no puede ver que soy sordo, tampoco puedo dejar de escuchar. <coughs> Black Billy Waters at his pitch, Adelphi Theater, 1790s. All men are beggars, white or black. Some worship gold, some pedal brass. My only house is on my back. I play my fiddle, I stay on track. Give my peg leg, thank you, sir, a jolly thwack. All men are beggars, white or black. And the plink of coin in my gunny sack is the bittersweet music in a life of lack. My only house is on my back. Was a soldier once, let a failed attack in that greener country for the Union Jack, all men are beggars, white or black. Crippled as a crab, sugary as sassafra, I'm black Billy Waters, and you can kiss my sweet ass. My only house weighs on my back. There he struts, like a Turkish cracker jack. London cues for any novelty, and that's a fact. All men are beggars, white or black. And to these bright brown upstart, Hack among kings, one piece of advice, 
don't unpack. All the home you'll know is on your back. I'll dance for the price of a mean cognac. Sing gay songs like a natural born maniac. All men are beggars, white or black. So let's scrape the cut gut clean. Stack the quartz three deep. See, I'm no quack. Though my only house is on my back. All men are beggars, white or black. This one was hard to translate because of all the rhythm and the rhymes. Let's see what I did. Black Billy Waters en su tono. Teatro Adelphi de Londres, década de 1790. Todos los hombres son mendigos, blancos o negros. Unos adoran el oro, otros trafican latón. Mi única casa va sobre mi espalda. Toco mi violín, sigo por buen camino, doy a mi pata de palo. Gracias, señor, un alegre porrazo. Todos los hombres son mendigos, blancos o negros. Y el tintineo de las monedas en mi saco de arpillera es la música agridulce de mi vida de privación. Mi única casa va sobre mi espalda. Una vez fui soldado. Lideré un ataque fallido en aquel país más verde para la Union Jack. Todos los hombres son mendigos, blancos o negros. Tullido como un cangrejo, meloso como el sasafrá. Yo soy Black Billy Waters y puedes besarme el dulce culo. Mi única casa pesa en mi espalda. Allá se pavonea como un campeón turco. Londres hace cola por cualquier novedad. Y eso es un hecho. Todos los hombres son mendigos, blancos o negros. Y para este brillante y moreno advenedizo, aficionado entre reyes, un pequeño consejo. No deshagas las maletas. Todo el hogar que poseerás está sobre tu espalda. Bailaré por el precio de un infame coñac. Cantaré canciones vistosas como un maníaco innato. Todos los hombres son mendigos, negros o blancos. Así que raspemos las cuerdas del todo. Apilemos los acordes de tres en tres. Mira, no soy un charlatán. Aunque mi única casa esté sobre mi espalda. Todos los hombres son mendigos, blancos o negros. And the last two... Eight Victory Cottages, Peckham, 1860. Tot is tot. Not true what the living claim we regret in the last hour. No memory is worth blubbering through, nor scrabbling for favor in the eyes of our children, nor honor sought among friends. Drool travels unnoticed from color to pillow while suspended by blankets a thy dangles, blameless and bare. Shame has lost its sting in this penultimate hell, these next to last days when we're still ourselves. I don't need wine or gossip or weather. I don't give a fig for warm socks or, don't laugh, the summer's first pair, a fruit I haven't been able to digest for 20 years and have mourned for as long. What's any of it? compared to this draining of humors, this wondrous uncaring, pains and interference. Love is cumbersome, for I loved only what my fingers could do, and even they did not serve me forever. Uh, this poem is uh, uh, Bridge Tower, uh, about to die of old age and forgotten after Beethoven had um, eliminated him from the music scene in Vienna. <coughs> Ocho de Victory Cottages, pueblo de Peckham, 1860. Tot ist tot. No es cierto. Lo que aseguramos los vivos lo lamentamos a última hora. No hay recuerdos por los que merezca la pena llorar a lágrima viva, ni revolverse por el favor delante de nuestros hijos, ni honor que se busque entre los amigos. La baba viaja inadvertida del cuello a la almohada mientras, suspendido de las mantas, cuelga un muslo, sin culpa y desnudo. La vergüenza ha perdido su aguijón en este penúltimo infierno, estos días próximos a los últimos, cuando todavía somos nosotros mismos. No necesito vino, ni cotilleo, ni clima, no me importan un pimiento, calcetines de abrigo, ni, no te rías, la primera pera del verano. Una fruta que no he podido digerir en 20 años y por la que he guardado luto tanto tiempo. 
¿Qué es nada de esto comparado a este drenaje de humores, esta asombrosa indolencia? El dolor es una interferencia. El amor es engorroso. Pues solo amé lo que podían hacer mis dedos e incluso ellos no me sirvieron para siempre. And the last one, I, I remember um, speaking with Rita about this one. Um, um, it's called The End with Map Quest, but these days um, it would probably be Google Maps, I guess, uh, instead of, of, of the Map Quest. The End with Map Quest. Will I cry for you, Paul Green? Will I drag out your end, though it is long past? Though I drove slowly past the place of your dying days and recorded what I knew I'd find there, families in townhouses, a sense of old folks hall parked us in the carport behind the green grate? Will I tell you, whispering to no one in particular, how even the street sign seemed greasy and that it was raining, Natch, and whenever I try to focus on the thought of you laid out in one of those miserable victory cottages, no turrets, no gilded palms, no jiggling regents, regents. I had to do something, crack a joke or snap another useless photo of the Bellenden Primary School. But when we turned left to round the block for the fifth time, it was the perfectly dismal side of a fast food joint on the corner Sam's kebabs, which cheered me. Would you understand? The red and yellow neon script, shouting like a Janissary band, so tacky it was buoyant. Colorful because there was no good reason to be afraid of shouting with the whole world determined not to hear you, though they tried to shut you up all the time. Do I care enough? George Augustus Bridge Tower to miss you? I don't even know if I really like you. I don't know if your plane was truly gorgeous or if it was just you, the sheer miracle of all that darkness, swaying close enough to touch, palm tree and sambo and glistening tiger running circles into golden oil. Ah, oh, Master B, Beethoven, little great man, tell me, how does a shadow shine? Finalmente, el último. Comentaba antes que eh, con Rita eh, nos reíamos porque el poema está, se titula Fin con MapQuest, cuando MapQuest se utilizaba todavía, eh, pero hoy en día ella hubiera escrito uh, Google Maps, ¿no? uh, Fin con, con Google Maps. Fin con MapQuest. Lloraré por ti, Paul Green. Prolongaré tu fin, aunque haga tiempo que pasó. Aunque condujera lentamente por el lugar de tus últimos días y anoté lo que sabía que encontraría allá, familias en adosados, un apropiado Fox Hall mal aparcado en el garaje detrás de la rejilla verde. Te contaré, susurrando a nadie en particular, cómo hasta la placa de la calle parecía estar grasiente. Y que llovía, claro, siempre que yo intentaba concentrarme en la idea de ti, yaciente en una de esas miserables cabañas, sin torretas, ni palmas doradas, ni meneo de regentes. Tenía que hacer algo, soltar un chiste o hacer otra foto inútil de la Bellenden Primary School, pero cuando giramos a la izquierda para rodear la manzana por quinta vez, fue la visión perfectamente funesta de un antro de comida rápida en la esquina, Sam's Kebabs, lo que me animó. ¿Lo entenderías? Las letras de neón rojo y amarillo, chillando como una banda de genízaros, tan horteras que eran alegres, coloridas porque no había ningún buen motivo para tener miedo de gritar con el mundo entero determinado a no escucharte, aunque intentaran callarte todo el tiempo. ¿Me importa lo suficiente, George Augustus Bridge Tower, echarte de menos? Ni siquiera sé si me gustas. No sé si tu interpretación era verdaderamente espléndida o si solo eras tú, el puro milagro de toda esa oscuridad meciéndose lo bastante cerca como para tocar. Palmera y zambo y tigre reluciente trazando círculos en aceite dorado. Ah, maestro B. Beethoven, pequeño, gran hombre, dime, ¿cómo brilla una sombra? Thank you very much.
if you guys have any questions or comments, I'll be glad to take it. This is my only translation that is not bilingual, and it was made against my will. Um, the problem is that the original is a very extensive book for a poetry collection, and the bilingual edition was going to be around, was going to be like beyond 500 pages in the translation of Spanish. So the, the publishers, who are actually one of the main publishers in Spain and Latin America these days, even them wanted to be a little bit conservative in this case and just publish the original, I mean the, the translation. Um, also because Rita Duff's poetry, and the, the planet is like that, right? Rita Duff is totally unknown in Spain and in Europe it, she's not very well known either. I guess in Britain it's a little different, but she's not known. So for the publishers this was uh, a bet. No, it, was an, it, was a, it was an adventure. Uh, so. Uh, big expense on translation and bilingual edition uh, would have not ruined them, but would have been bad news if they couldn't sell it. So I don't know how that is going. Uh, we actually are very frustrated, Rita and I, because we've been trying to go to um, Spain. We've been invited over and over to go to Spain to present her book, but the pandemic, right? The pandemic. Uh, next week, we were supposed, and I'm going to be, but she's not, uh, we were supposed to present her book, both the original and my translation, The Palace of La Alhambra in Granada, uh, that was reserved only for her. And me as a little side uh, with her, a privilege for me. Uh, and she couldn't because we can travel, but she, um, she has a health uh, issue that is not allowing her to travel at this time, so it's frustrated again. Uh, but we will try. So we still, it's a book that still has to fly in Spain. You know? Fortunately, I mean, luckily, hopefully after the pandemic. I think, I'm going to answer you with, a, with an anecdote uh, that happened with my grandmother. My grandmother, uh, I mentioned my grandfather this morning, so uh, her, his wife, my grandmother, I lived with them, they, they were illiterate, they couldn't read or write, and they didn't have a lot of, as we say in Spanish, a lot of world, you know, they didn't travel much, never meet many people around them. And uh, I remember that one day when I was in, in high school, I was deciding what, to, what language to take, and German was an option. At that point, I, I had not been interested in German, but I discovered a poet that I liked and that I meet in person in Madrid in a recital that was from Germany, and that piqued my curiosity. So I remember mentioning, maybe I'll take German in, in high school. And my grandmother, poor thing, is like, German? But German sounds horrible. Like, <laughs> Spanish is, our language is so beautiful, and German is such an ugly sentence. And then I, I, I kept thinking, I'm like, she's like, Grandma, how many Germans have you ever heard in your, <laughs> speaking in your entire, like real Germans? And she's like, I always listen to them in the Nazi movies. So and they, they're, and I'm like, ah, okay. So that's all my grandmother, that's all the German my, grandma, my grandmother had heard. Uh, the German that actors play in uh, war movies when they're the bad guys, Nazis and criminals. So he's like, of course they're gonna speak horrible, but that's not German. <laughs> So I don't think Spanish is more passionate than any other language, more or less. Um, all languages are equipped to translate, or at least to, in, 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 in the hands of masters like Rita, uh, to communicate uh, spirits and souls that have been bred in that, within that language. Um, I like, I, I have a, um, a, part of my profession is performing poetry, my own poetry. Um, and maybe that's what you've seen when I read in Spanish. Um, but with the original, I've tried to keep it a little lower 
because it's not mine, it's Rita. And, and it's, 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 I'm not an, Amer an American, I'm an, I'm not an adopted American, but my, obviously my native language is not English. Um, so uh, maybe that's why. No, I, I've allowed myself a little bit more of freedom to choose my tone in my Spanish translation. De nada. Mm -hmm. sí. So how did the choosing of the colors come about for the colors? Because they're very opposite, but yeah, the same book. Other than the design, um, like for example, this collection uh, always has like this black square and then the, the typography and design of the title and the name of the author and translator is always the same, o only this part changes. Uh, in both editions, obviously in the original, but also in the translation, it's been uh, Rita's choices. Oh, okay. So I really don't know why she chose. I never asked her. Uh, obviously, she'd yeah. been. Yeah, because I mean, when you think of hmm. Spaniards and Spanish, the red and black, you know, the flamingo kind of look. Maybe she thought about that um, uh, more than the black, because the black is always the same for all collections. I mean, for all titles. I think she probably chose the, the yellow and the, and the red because that's the flag of Spain. Uh, but, but honestly, we never discussed it. Um, that's something that she probably um, discussed with the editors. Um, uh, it was not part of my choice. But obviously, everything was done to her, uh, to her taste and choice and will. Do you know how old she is? How old was She won't tell, but I think I, uh, let's see. She won't tell, but she's not. Li in, in Spain, we're less polite with age, so uh, she doesn't have it in her original. We have it in the translation. So, she was she was born in um, Akron, Ohio, in 1952, and she was. Uh, in this information, uh, years are more uh, uh, conflictive here, uh, but she was um, um, poet laureate of the United States from 1993 through 1995. Pulitzer in 1987. Actually, she won the Pulitzer Prize in 87 with the, the with the, a book that I actually was my first choice to translate. But the editor was like, if you want to, you can. I, I'm lucky enough that at this point in my life I can choose what to translate and without deadlines and everything. But they, they didn't want to risk it that much because it was for Thomas and Beulah. Yeah. Thomas and Beulah tells the story of her grandparents and it's a, it's, it's a genuine um, African-American experience during the 40s and 50s in the States in a very specific context that all Spaniards were gonna miss, were gonna miss. So the editor was like, the book is amazing in its context. It's a masterpiece, it's a Pulitzer Award. We're not gonna sell a single copy because it's not a relat relatable story. Uh, all the characters that appear, there, there's a lot of uh, historical characters in, the, in, the, in, in there, implied and a lot of uh, context that. It's very so, so it was kind of funny, some of the stuff. Say that again? It was kind of funny, some of the stuff. It, uh, it's entertaining. Oh, entertaining, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it is, it is. Yeah. But, um, uh, so Nata Mulatica, I think, uh, works better for now. I, 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 let, I, I mean, at least until she's more known, more famous in, in yeah. Spain, where people are more interested and therefore investigate more about her, her environment, her culture, uh, the U.S. that she knows. I think I saw another hand somewhere, but I can't remember. Yes? You mentioned um, the problems with maybe publishing a, a bilingual edition with mm -hmm. extended text. Uh, but usually when you translate into Spanish, sometimes it takes more work than you do in English. Was that a concern that the publishers say you have a limit or do you mm -hmm. do the best job you can? Not in this one, because of mainly two reasons. First, <clears throat> it's a very narrative book. So um, when you open it, if you don't pay attention to the content, you think it's just another poetry book with the lines and separation. However, the tone is not very densely lyrical in this specific uh, book. So it was not that hard to translate. I, I don't think the, let's see, the translation is 250 and the original is yeah, it's, it's literally seven, seven pages less, and it may be just the, the difference in white pages in between. Um, so no, that was not it. It happens to me when I translate, uh, let's say, the standard lyrical poetry collection, um, especially if it's measured. For example, I remember when I started translating, I would translate Milt Milton Shakespeare, and uh, it, that, that is impossible to keep uh, the same measure uh, with when, um, um, 
iambic pentameter, uh, it's too short in Spanish, like the endecasyllable uh, that more or less translates into Spanish is, is too short. So in those cases, yes, with meter poetry, yes. Uh, my uh, my uh, odyssey waiting for me in the future is translating uh, Canterbury Tales in the original meter, but that's, uh, that's a monster ahead. <laughs> Uh, no, actually, I could do it. I, I studied. I studied the. Um, uh, this this was uh, when I studied in college in Spain. Was a time where, before you touch any literature or any creative writing or any like cool stuff, you had to learn all the history and evolution of the language from Latin to now. So we had to memorize all the dialectal changes through the centuries. I don't remember a single thing. It's the, tip, the typical thing you had to memorize for an exam, and it's like, okay, they spoke in the 15th century, they spoke like, they, they pronounced the T in this certain way uh, from 1392 to in this little area with this, oh. but, uh, but no, I wouldn't do it. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't try to do that. I will just try to respect the rhyme, if possible. Uh, it probably will be impossible in all of it, uh, but the meter, I have some ideas. We can discuss them later if you're interested. <laughs> yeah. right. No more questions, comments? Thank you so much for Thank coming to hear me. Mm -hmm. And I, And I totally recommend you read his original book. Uh, it's published by Norton and now obviously has a soft cover edition and everything. Uh, it's an amazing story uh, about this character and it's, it's a real story. It's based, based on a real character. <laughs>